Well, hello, I'm Steph. Um, I'm a talent advisor at Closer IQ. Welcome everyone to our second quarterly Women in Sales event. Super excited to have you guys all here. Even from the last uh, event, our, our community has grown and, it, and it's really wonderful to see. Um, yeah, really the, the, the purpose of Women in Sales is to build community, foster mentorship, kind of create a place where we can all share um, our experiences and our different knowledges um, about sales and just, you know, our careers in general. Um, so before we get started, I'd love to thank our sponsors. WeWork, you have been absolutely phenomenal um, in a partner for this event. Uh, thank you so much for hosting us tonight um, and helping on the logistic front. We are so excited to be in your headquarters. Um, and also, as Closer IQ has just been a huge, like, we have completely used WeWork throughout, like, how much we've grown, um, and we're so happy to be part of that community. Um, we have Visibo as a sponsor as well, who has totally made the event marketing side of things so easy, seamless, as, you know, from check-in to ticket sales, their platform it has been phenomenal. Um, we have the sauce, who is here tonight, Anthony, hello, who has been kind enough to actually be here and also just hand out um, his, his uh, wines and his rosé, which is fun and, and great. Um, they make um, delivery and subscription wines super fun. <laughs> And also um, Dirty Lemon, who has provided some samples for um, tonight as well. Hopefully you guys got to try them. All right, so without further ado, I'll turn it over to Chels, who, um, who will introduce the event. Well, thank you everyone again for being here and thank you to our sponsors. Um, appreciate the intro, Steph. Um, so basically, just to kind of go over you know, the topic of tonight and the format of tonight, and then we'll let the uh, speakers introduce themselves. But uh, we appreciate you all being here. Like Stephanie said, this is all about building community, and tonight's event is specifically about finding and fostering mentorship. Um, so it seems to be a topic that a lot of people hear about, but it might be a little bit more of a gray area as to how do you find a mentor? How do you maintain those relationships? What does the mentee do in the relationship to provide value? So there's a lot of questions that we see surrounded about this topic. And, um, tonight we actually have an actual mentor-mentee relationship to actually speak about what that's like. Um, so we'll go ahead and go through some formatted questions tonight, and we've actually um, left a lot of time for Q&A, so be thinking about your questions uh, for the end, and we'll kind of get into that, and then afterwards we will also do some extra networking so that you can all mingle a little bit more with one another. Um, so I will go ahead and now turn it over to our speakers, Tracy and Rachel, to introduce themselves. I'll go first. Uh, so I'm Rachel. I, um, the two uh, jobs that I would feel, or two companies that uh, I've worked at that are most significant in my career have been Booker, where I met Tracy, um, where we sold a point of sale type software to small business um, and mid-market. And then uh, I also have worked for and continue to work for a company called Percolate um, in business development. So my path so far has been in sales um, and just moving into uh, different roles. Uh, I think right now my passion is building pipeline for startup tech companies and um, leadership as well. Mentorship comes along with that. But uh, those have been my two uh, record companies. Excellent. She's my favorite, so I'm really excited that I'm here tonight as a mentor-mentee conversation. My name is Tracy Solanas. My background, you know, coming up was an enterprise sales rep myself. Probably one of the, the reason I got to New York 15 years ago was with a company called OpenTable. Um, it was early days at OpenTable. I used to open markets for them, so I'd fly into a city, interview, hire, train the reps sell the top brands like Nanny Myers, the world myself, and do a launch party and move on to the next. They actually moved me to New York. I kept saying, oh, I want to move to New York. The CEO finally said, hey, I don't know what's going on with New York. It's the people, the product, or the place. So I arrived um, two days before 9-11 and been here ever since. So OpenTable kind of got me on the path of 
companies that really automate, um, taking people from pen and paper to automation, which has continued to be a theme, I think, because recruiters are so good these days, uh, that they can kind of see very easily what your core competency is, and they keep offering you great jobs that follow that um, same path. For me, Booker was a breakout role for a couple of reasons. It was the first time in my life, I always say, if you don't take a job where you are stretched for the first 90 days, then it was worthless, right? It was a lateral move. So you should feel like a fish out of water for 90 days, minimum. I think I felt like that at Booker for probably eight months, because it was such a leap forward in my career and figuring out everything on a daily basis and not really having the resources to, to do it. So I built Booker from, uh, well, two sales reps. One later moved into accounting, so you can see how um, qualified the team was when I moved in. And half a million dollars in revenue, I built it to over $22 million in revenue when I was managing that team directly. Um, and then skip forward a couple, the last one was um, Shopkeep. And Shopkeep was the first time I went into a company that was around $30 million in revenue. So it was very different managing an existing team and looking to scale that um, in all the different challenges that I face. So I'm really excited to be here tonight and uh, to share with all of you and to get the questions back as well. Thanks. Awesome. Great introductions. Um, so to kind of expand upon that, and I know that you both also mentioned it with Booker, but would love for you both to kind of give your perspective of how your working and mentoring relationship kind of started. So I have an image that I can't get out of my head about when I first met Tracy. But I hope it's good. <laughs> it's a good image, I promise. So I just remember um, being on a bus uh, in a Forever 21 suit, um, headed to New York, and I was very excited about the opportunity of working in New York. I was also really excited about the potential to work at this company because it really combined my interest in sales um, and getting into sales and also in uh, beauty. Uh, we were selling to an industry, beauty was the industry we were selling into, and I, you know, remember distinctly meeting Tracy, um, and she was, you know, super fashionable, and she was from the West Coast, and she liked wine, and I was like, okay, there's instant chemistry, thank God. <laughs> um, so that, that story, I, I just, it's very memorable, because she called me on my bus ride home. It was a five-hour bus ride, and I'm just, like, reviewing everything that went in my head about the interview. Did it go okay? And, of course, she was like, I've never done this before, but uh, you're hired. <laughs> I was like, okay, and I didn't know what I was really in for, but then, uh, you know, I started um, literally one couple weeks after I graduated, so I didn't take any breaks, and um, I just jumped right into anything, and the kind of the beauty of our relationship, and as it started, was I was like the most junior person there. Um, there was, I was the 20th employee, so there weren't that many people there yet. Um, we were going to grow that company to 400 people before I left, so there were just so, there was so much growth opportunity, and because of the nature of me being so junior and her being so senior, there was just a natural, <laughs> there was a natural path to learning um, from her. Like, she didn't have to say anything, really. I could just watch her, and I was learning constantly, um, and I think you know, obviously she was my boss, so your boss is typically not your mentor from the get-go, because um, she's your boss. Um, but, you know, because we had this natural chemistry, um, and because, you know, I was always, like, wanting to take initiative and kind of go over the top, and, like, I was just wanting to learn. Like, this was my first real job. I was living in New York City. Um, it was a natural, like, path to me learning as much as I possibly could. Later, we um, didn't work as closely together because the company grew and she hired kind of layers in between us. So it became more of a mentor relationship once we weren't actually, I wasn't directly reporting to her. Um, so I would always jump at the opportunity to say like, hey, Tracy, like, I noticed something, da 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 like, hi, bye. You know, she was super busy, overbooked all the time, flying around the world, coming back, and just with these glorious sales stories, and I would just sit in her office and listen, you know. Um, I think a, a big part of our, you know, developing that relationship is, um, you know, being open to just sucking up the knowledge and you know, not necessarily, like, having something specific that you're pulling out, especially initially, later in, later in that relationship, it becomes a little bit different as it evolves. But um, yeah, I think that's kind of how we kicked our, off our relationship. And you know, as, as she moved on to other companies and I've moved on to other companies, she's kind of been that, that female boss um, that I can go to for advice um, within my career. So. 
So Rachel, Rachel, Rachel walked into my office and she was this bright-eyed, obviously highly intelligent, super passionate, um, live wire of energy that was just literally like bouncing off the walls when she was sitting in her seat. Uh, I was interviewing her for sales assistant. So at the, at, when I first came in, I was really just looking for people that had been trained somewhere else before. I didn't have time to train people. I didn't have the resources, et cetera. But it was a competitive market. And we didn't pay that much. And so I finally quickly realized I was going to I was gonna have to develop people on my own. I really was not being successful, especially against like the ZocDocs of the world that had started at the same time, recruiting from the outside with no recruiter, with no money, et cetera. So I said, I'm going to have to train them. So I started interviewing a couple people. and. Rachel was one of the first. Um, I said, well, if I can hire the person as a sales assistant straight out of college and somehow find the time to train them myself, then I can at least be assured that if I get the right person, which I know I'm, I, I think it's one of my competencies of picking the right people, um, then I know we're off to a good spot. So I, literally, like, you just, you can't hide intelligence and passion. And this one has it in spades, obviously. You can see now and you'll see by the end as well, even more. Um, and yeah, so I made her the offer, you know, pretty quickly. It wasn't, a, you know, too much of a formal process afterwards. I forgot it was on the bus, so that's that's fun to hear. Um, and and I think we just, we, you know, we'll, think, we'll talk more about all the rest of the steps. But that's how we initially met. Um, I was excited to have somebody intelligent, eager, um, ready to like learn and coachable. Coachable is key, and um, that's that was where it started. Awesome. Um, Perfect. So then kind of building off of just mentorship in general, um, would love to hear both of your perspectives and on basically what the biggest like values and benefits of mentorship has been for each one of you and whether that's in this relationship or other mentors, mentees that you've had along the way as well. Do you want me start? Sure. Okay. So both from my side as a mentee and also as a mentor? Sure. Okay. Um, I think rather recently, actually, I was invited to a dinner that was like heads of sales in New York, and I started going to these dinners. And I really quickly realized that not only was I the only woman, which I've kind of known for a while, but just never really thought about it. Um, but number two, most of, the, most of the men there had done a really good job of networking. They had always continued to know each other from job to job, they'd helped each other out. Maybe one got a request for a job and they weren't interested, so they gave it to another. And they also shared learnings, right? How would you build that comp plan? What would you do here, et cetera? And I realized, shoot, like I actually have made it, you know, with pretty much like very minimal outside assistance. And so in, certainly no one was actually absolutely direct doing my job in the same industry, in the same city advice. And so I'm on a very different path now because it's very important to me to actually start to network with my peers and expand my learning because I don't think you should ever stop learning. As I was very lucky, um, and I did have a couple of mentors in my life. One most specifically, actually I ended up, who's another one that I would love to have up here, Kelsey, who I also hired as a sales assistant and her aunt was the one person I would say was my mentor. I met her at a job, Biz360. Um, I told her exactly what I, she came in, interviewed me, said, what, you know, what do you want to do? And I said, I've been in enterprise sales for a really long time. I took, I don't really see myself as a VP of sales. I don't really want to do that right now. I think it's glorified babysitting. I wasn't ready for it. Um, but I was kind of looking for what's the next step. How am I going to learn more? And I said, maybe channel, maybe indirect lines of revenue. She'd had a background in channel. She filed it. She remembered it. When the came, time came at the business, she said, we're ready to do channel. I want you to lead channel, and I'm going to help you. I'm going to walk you through it. She's the one person I call it like my hotline call. So Ed Booker, when in the early days, when I said it was an eight-month learning curve, when I was out on the street at lunch freaking out, like, oh, my God, how, what, what do I need to do about X, Y, and Z? It was only one or two times, but I could call her and say, here's what I'm thinking. This is what I'm thinking of doing as a solution. What do you think about that? She wasn't in exactly the same space, but she could always give you a balanced approach. And so it's nice to be able to have that kind of hotline. Um, from a mentee perspective, I think we'll get more into this perhaps, but I don't want to talk too much at once. <laughs> I think for me, the mentee relationship has to start from a place of natural interest in chemistry. It's not a, it's not a, it can't be a forced thing. It can't be like, I want to mentor. I read Lean In and Sheryl Sandberg says that, whatever. I, I, it can't be like that. Not for me, at least. And I can't speak for others. Um, I think you can get great advice from different people. And 
I still would not call that a mentor-mentee relationship. I would call that being strategic about where to source information that can help you in making a decision on a specific topic or in your career. But a mentor-mentee, by the nature, requires time, energy, effort, and personal commitment. And for that, you actually have to care about the person. You have to be personally vested in that individual. Otherwise, like, I'm sorry, but I'm not going to, if someone pinged me and said, can we go for coffee or have a drink, I'm, I'm not going to respond. Or I'm going to say no, probably very nicely. But I barely see my husband, right? These days we work so much. It's, you come home, you got two hours. So um, it, it has to be something that I think is earned, just like trust is earned in any relationship over time. And then there is a natural relationship that is formed, and then both parties want to continue to put in the effort. It's really a relationship like anything else, and it can start very casually and then kind of peter out, or it can take off like ours has, and I consider Rachel a friend now. I'll take her call any day of the week. It's not an email or a call that I'll wait a week to respond to. I will call her back immediately, just like I would my mom or a friend, because that's the level that she's earned in my life. Thanks, Tracy. <laughs> you earned it. Okay, so just so I don't answer the third, the other question, can you yeah, repeat? Yeah, so, so what do you feel the biggest benefit of the mentor-mentee relationship is? Okay, so um, I have a slightly different take on mentorship than Tracy. Um, I think that there are um, many mentors in your life that you don't even know exist, and it's just a matter of figuring out what exactly you need help with and finding the right person to go to for that request. So for me, Tracy is, you know, she's got the wealth of experience in sales leadership at really quickly growing companies. And she knows me and she knows how I work and how I think. So anything that has to do with that, I'm gonna go to Tracy. But for example, if I have an issue at my current company and I had a previous boss that's moved on to another company, they know how I work, they know how my current company works, I'm gonna go to them first because I know that they're gonna give me advice that's relevant and within the current company that I'm at today. Um, I also wanna bring up, I know there's a lot of women here and this is a women's event, but I think it's also very important to realize the um, benefit of men um, and how, obviously, uh, it's harder to be a female in sales and is simply because there's not as many of us. Um, I don't know that that's gonna be uh, the same in the future. I feel like we're moving in the right direction there, but for now, um, you know, men have a unique, um, men can be there for women. It doesn't have to be, uh, you don't have to always find a female to seek advice from, especially if that person's qualified to give a response based on what exactly you're looking for. So I think for me, mentorship has really helped in pivotal moments in my career. So whether it's deciding that I want to get a new job, whether it's um, I have this crazy comp plan that I'm launching and everyone's going to hate my guts because it's, you know, you guys know what I'm talking about. Like, I'm going to call someone who understands the business and understands the people and how they're going to respond. And, um, or, you know, I'm going into this uh, crazy conversation about my salary with um, a new boss. Um, you know, I, I might actually call Tracy or I might call someone who knows this person. Um, you know, I think that it's really a scenario question and you probably have mentors in your life and you don't even know it. Um, but I, I look at mentorship and the definition of mentorship, by the way, is like uh, an experienced person giving wisdom to a less experienced person. So it's not like it has to be this big deal where you have to like maintain this long-standing relationship with this one person you come to that one person for every single thing um, I very much believe that like you can have mentors across your life for very different reasons and use them for different reasons as a result awesome um, so this leads in I think well to the next question and I know we've been trying not to answer them all at once but um, so kind of turning to the actual mentee portion of this mentoring relationship. So a lot of people are, you know, trying to reach out, trying to get your time and everything. So 
what do mentees do in this relationship to actually provide value back to the mentor? Okay, I'll start. <laughs> Um, so I'll answer this a couple ways. First, I think, you know, you obvi it starts with doing your best work all the time. And the reason why it starts there is you are always building your own personal brand wherever you go. And you never know who's going to notice you and who's going to, uh, you know, relate chemistry-wise. Tracy mentioned there has to be chemistry, right? There's this natural energy or, like, things you have in common with an individual, but there's also what you can control, which is doing your best work all the time and having that person respect you, a mutual level of respect. So I think that's where mentorship starts, is somebody can, who's more experienced than you can recognize that they can see themselves in you a little bit. Um, and then outside of that, once you've developed that relationship and you're maintaining it, it's like any other relationship that you maintain. You know, you're not going to never call um, or send an article to a friend that you just lost touch with that you, you know, used to be really close with. You're going to maintain that relationship. It's like any other relationship that you'll maintain. And there's this level of reciprocity as well, because sometimes as a mentee, you feel like, all right, I'm always asking for something, but each and every one of you have something that you can offer in return, whether it be, um, I have a candidate for you that I couldn't hire because of something, something, something. Tracy, like, I know you've been looking for someone, here you go. Or it's, I know you wanna see XYZ, who we both worked with, and I was just talking to XYZ, I'm gonna arrange a, a drinks for all of us to go hang out together, and she's like, I'm down, because she hasn't seen this other person in a while who might also be senior. So I think there's like little tactics that you can um, think about in maintaining that relationship when you're kind of in the side of having less power, per se. Um, the other thing I'll say is if you're the one that's suggesting to meet up, you want to make sure there's something specific that you're asking about to meet up about. I know you talked about like just throwing time on someone's calendar for coffee and not having an agenda is suicide. Um, so don't do that. You want to make sure there's something specific that you want to talk about. Um, and then also handle all the logistics with scheduling and picking a place and all that. Otherwise, it'll never happen meeting with that person. She knows me well. <laughs> um, no, I, I, listen, I agree with all of that. And I think the, the, most, the main thing is that it, it really does start by doing your best work. I do think that a lot of I think what Rachel said is true. Like it, for me, when I think of mentor, mentee, I do think of it as more on that committed kind of relationship level. I'm happy to provide advice or be a sounding board or answer questions in short bursts for many other people. But I, for me, I don't consider that like the mentor mentee relationship. So there is an extra level of commitment there. And so I do think a lot of them, well, at least for, for me, all of them have started in the workplace. I, it's been with someone I've worked for or someone I have work, has worked for me. And so it really does start by being someone that is noticeable um, by doing your best work by at, literally the best way you can add value to me if you work for me is by being a kick-ass salesperson. Oh my God, I'm sorry I cussed on your, hopefully that's okay. <laughs> Blurp that out. But the best, this best way is to literally do your best work and to be noticeable. And Rachel was always great at her job. She was always at my door asking for more. And she was obviously very intelligent and could do more. And she found interesting ways to, to actually help me um, for example, she walked in one day and, I don't know, she was talking and I was doing something. I was like, oh, I was like, whatever, making noises. And she's like, what's wrong? And I'm like, oh, this Excel spreadsheet, it's driving me mad. I've got to get this thing done for Daniel. And my head was just in a million places and Excel is not my forte. You know, my love, my age, we didn't learn it in college. I had to learn to self-learn it. No one really taught me. i not great at Excel. I could do the basics. She's like, I'm really good at Excel. I can do it. What do you need? What do you need? Okay, here you go. And she did what I needed in Excel, banged it out in like literally like 15 minutes. And I'm like, that is amazing. So as Rachel said, there's many places that you can add value um, within you know, the general workplace. So do your best work. If you feel like there's somebody that you have uh, an interest in that you would like to develop more as a potential mentor, Look for ways, like Rachel or I have talked about, that you can continue to add value not only in your existing job, but to that person in whatever 
whatever way that they are doing. So kind of going extra, you know, beyond what your, is your normal job function, perhaps. And, and then you're just, like we talked about before, you're going to have that relationship that's just going to kind of start naturally and that you have to, um, you have to, I guess, develop. You know, you have to spend the time to develop. And a lot of times it is the person that's the mentee that is doing more of the developing because even if the mentor feels equally about that person, they're usually just, by being older, a busier person, right? There's just more kind of going on that they could be more distracted. So that piece is on the mentor-mentee. But I also think there's a plenty of ways that if you have a specific question that you want answered, there, it doesn't have to be a mentor or mentee. And there are plenty of ways that you can connect with people in today's world to get that answer and have more, um, like more valued advice in a broader way. Yeah, so that's actually the perfect segue into the final formatted question that we have for tonight before Q&A. But um, for those here who are seeking a mentor, or perhaps even mentors seeking mentees. I think that there are a lot of different places you can go to find that um, and ways to be resourceful. So is there any advice that you would give to those people kind of seeking out that mentoring relationship and where they can go find it? Um, yeah, I think just look into your current network, look into your uh, the, the job experience you've had, the professional experience per se. Um, there are also, you know, parents, friends that can be helpful. Um, I don't know. I, I you can channel uh, through a friend. Do you know anyone who would be helpful to speak about this topic with? Um, and just come up with a random person who might be qualified to have that conversation. But I think at the end of the day, you want to make sure that you're, you figure out why you want to mentor, and then once you have that reason, you find the right person to give you that feedback. So, Perfectly said. Now, I 100% agree with that. I think that, like I just said, and I think I must have jumped the gun on the, on the questions, because um, I, I didn't remember them all, but... Um, you, you literally have two, in my mind, it's two different buckets, right? You have more of the mentor-mentee, which if, if and when it happens, it tends to be a longer-term relationship that you will both cultivate over time like any relationship. And then there are times in your life where you just need information, which is practically almost every day, right? We have different questions we might ask. We might ask our friend, our roommate, our significant other, our parent. And then there are ones that are more specifically work-related, and you have to just look for the places that you can find that. And obviously through social media, there's plenty of ways that you can connect through mutual friends to actually find somebody that could be relevant for you to ask that question to. So if you have a specific question about Let's say you're trying to get into a new industry or a new job. Um, if you are looking to get a promotion at work and you want to go for that next level job and you're not sure how to do it or if you're qualified or how to get the experience, there's just different places for you to go to get each of those. So just be aware that it's not one size fits all, that it really depends on the information that you're seeking and how you apply it. Great. Thank you both for answering all of that. So at this point, we would like to kind of turn it over to Q&A and let the audience ask a few questions. Um, we left a slotted amount of time for this at our last one in Q1. We didn't have quite enough time for it. So um, whoever wants to start, we can start with Q&A now. Don't all speak at once. <laughs> Go ahead. Just wondering, um, in terms of, there's a lot of talk about, okay, so like a mentee, you need to be really proactive and kind of, especially as a salesperson, getting up, asking a lot of questions, getting to know a lot of people. But how much do you think it's a responsibility of a mentor to also be proactive in seeing where people are struggling? Like a new salesperson saying, you know, that person seems talented, but they're not fitting in the culture, they're missing something. So what kind of responsibilities do you think mentors have in being proactive as well? So I think that for me, there's two things there. So one, um, if you, so, is a mentor that you're talking about in the in the same workplace? Sure. Okay. So you're saying your is it your boss, for example? Yeah. Okay. So you're saying my boss is is my mentor, and you feel like you have the mentor mentee relationship with your boss, but they're still your boss. So what responsibility does the mentor have to actually help you within your day to day job? Is that the question? Yes. Okay. Well, I would say first and foremost, like that is your 
that is her job or his job, right? I mean, it's not even about being a mentor. That person's job, literally, as your manager is, whether it's your, your fictitious you, um, that person's job literally is to help and to develop you and to make sure that you're the best version of yourself within the context of that job. So I don't actually consider that, I mean, while it might be a mentor relationship, it's not the mentor responsibility, it's the job responsibility. Um, if, if, let's say, the mentor now has moved on and they're outside of that current workplace, then the only way that they're going to be able to help you is when you continue to have ongoing communication and or you know, regular meetups where you have a specific question that, that they can answer. Does that make sense? Or do you have any further questions? No, that's questions? great. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I found it interesting. Um, so I did a little bit of research. I, I actually had the opportunity to work Catalyst, which is a large women leadership organization that elevates women. And, um, and in the conversation with men, like I was so excited to come here today because it's a bunch of women, all women, and that doesn't really happen often. But I'm also very much aware that this, those key positions of power are held by men. I mean, there's less than 95% of the positions held um, in corporate America, I mean, at least at this uh, Fortune 500 level, are, are women. I mean, there's just, Five percent. So, how do you, like, how do you? What is your advice on finding those male mentors, right? Because it's great that women are mentoring each other because we need it. But those key positions and often overlooked because when you have a man that's mentoring you, sometimes you're the young, attractive woman. They may not mentor you over a man just because it will make them look better. So, how do you kind of foster those relationships as well? I think, I mean, are you asking from the perspective of the mentee? The mentee, yeah. Okay. From the mentee's perspective, you kind of have to disregard the fact that they're male and just relate the way you would relate to any female. This is just my perspective. Um, I have plenty of male mentors in my life. And the reason for those mentors is the exact same reason as my female mentors. Um, and it's controlling what you can control and creating that brand within the workplace um, of a hard worker who goes above and beyond. Um, and most of the people who've worked their way up in the, in the company are similar people, right? And then relating to them and having some sort of chemistry. So I think that some of the challenge there, though, is that there's maybe less to relate on, less in common, per se. So I think it's finding what those things are in common and leveraging those. I think that's a really great question. Um, we've obviously focused on giving examples, I think, you know, more female related because we are in a unique and awesome situation of women in sales technology conference and haven't seen this many awesome, intelligent saleswomen in a room in maybe my whole life. So yes, we are talking about women, but I would agree with Rachel. I, I mean, I didn't have the benefit of hardly having any women, you know, as I came up through the ranks. And I certainly never, like I said, have seen this many women salespeople. By nature of some of the like, jobs, like Booker was spa management software, there were a lot of women, we were able to hire a lot of women, but that has not been my past. In fact, the co-founder of Booker is, is another one of my mentors, Daniel. Um, we hit it off from the beginning. I worked directly for him. He's the co-founder and was the managing director of Booker in the early days, and together he and I and the VP of Ops built the entire company from half a million to 20 million. He is my other hotline call. Every job I've ever taken since Booker I always talk to him. I always run past the job, because he's a reference for me too with every job. But, and that's the other thing that you'll get as an, as an advantage of that. Um, but I always go to him. So it doesn't, it doesn't have to be, you know, we say chemistry and sometimes that sounds eh, but it is just that connection where you actually want to spend time helping that other person. And it doesn't matter if it's women or men. Yes, there are many more men. So wherever you find the willingness and the connection and the um, source of advice, foster that. I'll give you my mic. Thank you. 
Um, hi, thank you so much for your advice, really appreciate it. Um, you mentioned earlier that you were at a head of sales dinner and you were one of the only women at the table. And um, I was wondering what kind of resources did you leverage, you know, be it a mentor-mentee relationship to kind of get there and be one of the few women head of sales for those of us kind of looking towards that direction? Work hard and be good at your job. It's not, it's not a woman or a man thing. I, you know, feminism, non-feminism, I, I, I don't look at any of that. I look at people and I look at being the best version of myself and be doing the best work I can and learning every single day. Those are the things that drive me. And somehow I did look around and it was only me, but it never bothered me. I've always worked exceptionally well with, with men. Like I used to joke with my brother, I'm kind of like half guy and maybe that's why we get along so well because I'm, I think a good blend of both, but I really do believe that at the end of the day, companies now, they, I mean, you're kind of lucky because in a lot of ways, people do want to, there is a focus on hiring women. There's a focus on balancing, you know, the, the numbers in technology, et cetera. So it's in the news, it's in the stream of conversation, et cetera. That never even existed when I was coming up through the ranks. I mean, I'm 45 years old. I know I look better than that, but I am. <laughs> so that didn't exist, you know? And all you could do is control, as Rachel said a few times, the only thing in life you can control is yourself, how you think, how you feel, how you act. And so all I would say is do your best work. People want to hire great people. And um, they're hard to come by. Good people are hard to come by. Sorry, a little segue. When I took my first big jump, when I took that job at Open Table, I came back from the, or I was scared about the interview, I think. And my, my roommate at the time said, Tracy, don't worry. Do not underestimate the value of normal. And I was like, what do you mean? She's like, when people interview a lot of people, they see all kinds of crazy. So when you see a smart, capable person that's right for the job and normal with a good personality, you're in, baby. You're in. <laughs> and, that, and that actually has held true as well. So I would just say, do your best work, work hard. And I think the, the tides are in your favor as far as the conversation people want to hire more. And there's a great technology scene in New York right now. I mean, literally, I get job offers every single day through LinkedIn. And there aren't that many. There aren't that many of us. So do good work. And there's plenty of opportunity for you to advance. The, my comment will be a cakewalk, or my question will be a cakewalk compared to the last two questions, but more so along the lines of time management and finding time when there's not a lot of time to be had. I mean, we're all here today, so go us. But what types of things do you two do? I'm just curious, in order to see each other and keep that relationship going, but in a way that's not, you know, either invasive to your personal lives or, you know, making sure it's still outside of work, making sure you're having fun and you're actually enjoying the time you spend together. Um, yeah, I think it's um, keeping a dialogue going, um, even if it's one touch point and then three months go by and another touch point. Like I think of Tracy all the time and I'm like, here, you would like this. So it's kind of like any relationship, and if you keep that relationship going um, and plan ahead, then you're going to plan around that engagement of whatever you schedule. So if I schedule something with her, it's probably pretty far in advance because she's all over the world all the time. Um, but it's planned in advance. It's in our calendar. We're both salespeople. We care about our calendars, and we look at them religiously. So um, you know, I think that's the best way to do it is to just plan ahead and pick something firm and put it in the calendar and look forward to it and plan around it. I don't think... Uh... No, the only other thing I'd add is I think that the longer you have the relationship, the more time will go by without you seeing that person. Just think of like best friends that you have in your life. Maybe you're friends with someone in high school or in your hometown. You might see them once a year, but you pick right back up. It, it does become that. I mean, Amy Garino, who I would consider a great mentor in my life, I honestly at this point maybe talk to her twice a year, and she's actually be in New York, and I'm gonna see her maybe this weekend. She's in town with her family, but it's, it's not as often, right? So when you're first in like kind of forming that relationship, you're usually working together, so it's, it's a lot, right? And you build that, and then right after you separate, because usually one leaves the place of employment and the other one you know, somewhere different, then that's the critical time to make sure you solidify 
like a long distance relationship. Anybody does that? I've got a lot of great advice on that topic. But anyhow, <laughs> frequency and momentum are key. So it's like that. And then as you are solidified, you can start to drift out and then you have the friendship. So when the person has the question or you want to get together, it, it's easy. Just one more thing. It's not as high maintenance as you think to have a mentor at all. Tracy, you mentioned a time when Rachel stood out to you by her help with Excel, and this is a question for both of you. What's something that you've seen recently, or what's something that has popped out at you for someone who has excelled? And what are the qualities of that person, and what is something that would stand out to you? I think it's um, having, and we're all in sales, so we're naturally um, people readers, but I think just knowing when your boss or whoever you're looking to be a mentor is um, stressed out and needing, <laughs> needing help, and you know, those are the moments where you can kind of swoop in and save the day, um, but like, it's just like matching any product with the pain, like, I hate to bring sales into this discussion at all, but like being able to come in and like realize that someone's having a rough day and trying genuinely to help fix that. And like, that's just my nature. I want to do that. I'm not thinking about mentorship at all while I'm doing that, but um, it's just something that I constantly try to do all the time. And if you think about actively doing that with your boss or your future mentor, that pays dividends. I was gonna ask, can people hear me? Um, when you were developing a relationship while working at the same company, specifically while Rachel was working for you, how did you manage like the personal relationship, the professional relationship, and sort of like respecting the power distance and like that kind of thing? Sure. I mean, in, in that regard, I wasn't considering it a mentor-mentee relationship. I just honestly just, it's not even where my thought was. I was just trying to survive. <laughs> <laughs> the job, right? And to be frank, I have a pretty strict rule. Like, if you work for me, I don't connect to you on social media. I'm not going to be your Facebook friend. And we're not going to connect on Instagram. We, we have another girl. She's hilarious. I, th I thought I was going to fire her because she just drove me mad. But somehow she stuck around. And the girl, every single time when she leaves, she's like, I love you. I'm going to connect. She Facebook friend me. I'm like, Rachel, it's completely inappropriate. I'm not going to be your Facebook friend. <laughs> it's another Rachel. It's another Rachel. It's another Rachel. <laughs> I was like, we can be Facebook friends sometime, perhaps. It's when we will no longer be working together. So in the context of when, you're, when that person is working for you or you're working for somebody else, then, it, it, like I said, I think to the, the question in the back, the initial question, it is that person's job to mentor you. It is their, that person's job to make you the best version of yourself so that you actually can be successful and help them achieve their goals. So if that's not happening, then that's already just a bad boss and you know, good luck to you, you should probably move on. But if, um, so it's not necessarily a mentor-mentee in that regard. I, I literally think that that's the beginning kernels of where it begins. And you start to see people that work for you that just rise above, right? I, I could have, you know, 40, 50 people working for me or multiple layers underneath me, but certain people will always have a light shining on them. And when you're working directly for someone, that's when you can um, most clearly demonstrate your capability because that person sees you every single day. They see the contribution you make to them and to the organization. So you have the best opportunity to essentially highlight yourself as, a, as somebody that is worthy of extra attention, really, and like, um, yeah, relationship. So I know that you guys developed your relationship because you worked at the same firm. If you were going to look outside of your company for a mentor-mentee relationship, how would you navigate that and how would you recommend positioning yourself in such a way that the mentor would be interested in taking you on as a mentee? So I work in business development, so that's what I do for a living is try to engage with people that I don't know and um, come up with a reason that they would want to talk to me and you know, set aside time. And that's kind of 
what you have to put in your brain when you're thinking about that, the answer to that question. It's like, if this is a person that's on your list to speak with, and there's a reason why, obviously, you've got to put that same sales prospecting brain on and figure out what is that unique reason that I can stimulate the interest enough so that they would actually spend time with me because their time is so valuable. You're selling time when you're selling software or whatever you're selling, and you're selling time when you're trying to meet up with a new potential mentor, too. So it's, it's thinking through the same lens that you, you do your job, um, and it's applying it in your real world. One thing to add. The only thing I'd add about that is, just like in sales, the easiest way to get a sale is a referral versus cold calling. So, you know, I get LinkedIn requests every single day from recruiters, from people trying to sell me stuff as a head of sales, et cetera. So that's going to be a harder path for you, quite frankly, if you ping somebody that you don't have any relationship with and ask for time, no matter how good a message you have, um, how good your you know, value prop is, if you will. But if you get a referral, then depending on the strength of those two people's relationship, that is what is going to actually get you the time. So again, it goes back to just like in sales, being prepared, do your research, understand what you're trying to achieve, and then find the best way there. Right? So if you, have, if, you, if you identify a couple people or a person, whatever, that could be this potential source of information for you, then use all of your effort to try and triangulate someone to actually introduce you to this person. Right? Like if you were working for Rachel and you, know, you had a specific question that maybe I was best suited to answer, and you said to Rachel, I have a specific question, I would love to you know, just spend 10 minutes on the phone with Tracy, do you think that you could help me with that? Based on the strength of your relationship, she's going to say yes or no. She doesn't want to bring somebody to me and waste my time if it's not valid. You know what I mean? If it's not worth it, frankly. So that's the first piece. And then the second piece is, yes, if Rachel says that somebody wants to spend 10 minutes with me and it's that important, I'll take it based on the strength of this connection. Awesome. I think we have time for maybe one more. So I don't know if we can get a microphone back, but <laughs> we can pass it back there. So I have a quick uh, question. So balancing, going back to kind of like professionalism and how you present yourself every day and how you've built yourselves in your careers from like the bottom up, how do you put your best foot forward every day? And let's say the startup mentality is to wear many hats and always say yes and, and, you know, and that's how you get yourself going and get yourself noticed and advance yourself. So how do you balance you know, between saying yes and uh, putting up boundaries so that you can remain you can keep yourself professional and not let things fall through the cracks, you know? Because it's a very stressful environment. And so, you know, in my mind, from my personal experiences, always say yes to everything. But then how, how do you come off and how do you keep, you're one person, you know? And I think I'd love to hear kind of how you've done it and presented your, you know, your best self every day, learning to say no and how you go about that and still exude professionalism because sometimes it can come off in your mind as like conflicting, uh, you know, to say no, it's, it, could, it can mean that you're not wanting to help as much, right? But it's actually trying to be professional. So how do you go about doing that? So. This is um, perfectly relevant because Rachel and I actually were having a bit of wine and cheese back there and talking about this very same topic. So I'll talk for two seconds and then I'll let her um, take it. Listen, I think that that's a, um, a never ending uh, goal for both of us. Both of us are naturally highly energetic people that have a high aptitude for like doing more, learning more, et cetera. As Rachel said, I'd come back from like a worldwide trip and be like, boom, I'm, I'm back in it. So part of it is, is our nature, but to your point, which would, what does start to surface later, and I saw this with a couple of people that uh, reported to me later after Booker, and same thing. They wanted to say yes all the time, and they did, but then they started not delivering on on projects or tasks, and I'd have to follow up with them. Well, you're no good to me, especially as a director of sales, if I'm having to follow up with you to ask you if you did X, Y, and Z when that is your job, right? So there is a balance that you have to strike between um, you know, wanting to say yes and, and proving yourself, but also still being actually capable of delivering on time. Because the one thing you do not want is to offer help and then not deliver. Or ha God forbid, have the person that you're trying to help have to follow up with you or chase you for that information. Now you've just created actually two times the work for me. 
I gave it up. I was probably concerned about relinquishing control. And now I have to follow up and chase you, and it's still not done. So the answer is not necessarily an easy one, and it's not necessarily clear. You have to get as good as you can about time management, try and schedule your time. And then it's not, it's not a no. It's, hey, you know, these are things I'm currently working on. Um, you know, and then basically probably one of those is something that somebody else, that person asked you to do. Um, I can absolutely do that. Do you think this is more important than that? Or what are, what are you thinking from a time frame perspective? When, you know, I think I can do it by X. And try and give them a reasonable time frame of when you could actually do it. And a lot of times, even if that person wants it yesterday, it's probably still okay. Everybody wants everything yesterday in our, to our world, but you have to come to a negotiation, like sales, right, to a place that actually is possible. So as Tracy mentioned, I have a problem with this too. I'm a yes, I'm yes, I'll do this, yes, I'll do that. The other problem with me is I have so many ideas and I always suggest all these ideas and then it's like, okay, who's on to deliver on the idea? And then it happens to be me again. So I think there's always a balance of like, if you have a really good idea, flesh the idea out in your head, decide is this something I wanna bring up and actually own? Um, because you're not gonna bring it up and be like, okay, you got that and you got that. So that's the other flip side of um, saying yes to everything. But I think back to what Tracy was mentioning, if you actually take ownership of something and you proactively are agreeing with your boss or whoever you're working with that this is a project that you're owning, you have to deliver. You have to deliver your best work. You have to deliver in a timeline. You, the last thing you wanna have happen is that person to come back and follow up with you. So um, just to re-emphasize that, I think the other part is like saying no takes a lot of practice. Um, so like what Tracy was saying, like coming back to that person and saying, well, I have like this and this and this and this and this already in line. Like, do you think this is more important or this is more important? That takes a lot of practice, especially with um, a boss. But I think what a boss can do is help you prioritize those things. And if you come to your boss, you know, with a genuine request, hey, I have all these things that I've said yes to, like, can you help me prioritize, which is important. They can kind of play that role of defending you with that other team and extend that time for you on your behalf. That's what your boss is for. So, um, you know, I think part of it is on you, um, but then part of it, you can leverage other people to kind of help you with that. Awesome. Well, that concludes our Q2 Women in Sales event tonight. Um, we want to just give a round of applause for our speakers, Tracy and Rachel, tonight. Um, thank you again all for coming. Thank you, speakers. This was incredible to get this type of conversation going. And this community keeps growing, so we look forward to seeing everyone in Q3 as well at the next Women in Sales event. Um, so please feel free to stick around. There's more wine, cheese. We're going to do some more networking. but. Thank you again all for being here, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>